revolución y prometen seguir siéndolo a lo largo del siglo XXI. Y para hablarnos de parte de esta revolución tenemos hoy el placer de tener con nosotros a Michel Dumont, viene del Material Science Engineering Department de la, de la, universidad, la universidad de Burdeos, en Francia, y nos va a hablar acerca de eh, polímeros celulares a escala micro y nano, y en concreto eh, su, su proceso de fabricación. Michel Dumont es eh, profesor, eh, full profesor, es el equivalente a catedrático de universidad en la Universidad de Burdeos, en Francia. Entre el año 93 y 2004 fue profesor en, en el INSA de Lyon. Anteriormente estuvo en una estancia postdoctoral en la Universidad de Düsseldorf, en Alemania, trabajando con eh, cristales líquidos poliméricos para aplicaciones óptica, de óptica no lineal. Y en 1991 leyó su tesis doctoral en la Universidad de, de Burdeos, también, en, que versaba sobre polímeros, cristales líquidos poliméricos con aplicaciones ferroeléctricas, y es, además de todo esto, director del Departamento de Ciencia de Materiales e Ingeniería en la Universidad de Burdeos. Sus líneas de trabajo, muy brevemente descritas, son tres. Eh, espumas poliméricas, materiales compuestos poliméricos y reciclado de materiales poliméricos. Yo no os robo más tiempo. Thank you very much, uh, Michel, uh, for for being with us. And it's really a pleasure for for us uh, attend you or to your talk. And the time is yours. <laughs> Thank Gracias. you very much. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Uh, I will talk in English. I, I can understand Spanish. The questions could be in Spanish, but I will talk in English. Uh, first, so as uh, Professor Pastor said, I come from uh, Bordeaux, and I will tell you just a few slides about the city of Bordeaux and uh, the campus, the University of Bordeaux. So uh, Bordeaux is uh, located in France, in the southwest of France here, the region is Aquitaine, uh, in Espanol, Aquitania, no sé. Uh, it's about one hour flight from Madrid, and uh, the region of Aquitaine is, of course, famous for the vineyards, the wine, but as well, the, it's a city from the, from the 18th century, so there is a series of building interesting to see along the river here as well there is a seaside along the Atlantic Ocean uh, football rugby teams football team is is really bad actually compared to Real de Madrid <laughs> and this is the, the overview of the city this is the river Garonne and the different buildings as I told you it's a city mainly built in the um, 18th century this is a new tram there is three lines of tram, one of them is going to the university campus. This is the, the entrance of the university campus, which is a bit aside from Bordeaux in a city called uh, Talence as well, together with two other cities uh, around Bordeaux. It's about 20 minutes from Bordeaux, and it is uh, in surface, in area, the most extended uh, campus for students. This is the old part of the campus, which used to be, um, I don't know what is the Espanol, or an abbey in English, from... Uh, this, <laughs> this is uh, um, the, the bridge between the old part and the new part of the city. Uh, the library, it's a new one. This is now the city of Bordeaux along the river. On the left side, you see the river, the old bridge from Napoleon and the 18th century buildings. This is one of the buildings called Place de la Bourse. Bourse is uh, in the mean of um, share of wines in, in this century. Uh, this is the same building by night, Place de la Bourse. This is the bridge the old bridge of Bordeaux along the river Garonne. This is the theater for music and opera. 
Uh, now let's come to the uh, studies part. There are about 60,000 students and 3,500 researchers. And the universities are labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, which is 1 for science and technology, 2 for uh, medical studies, 3 for uh, letras, uh, that means science, uh, philosophy, and uh, 4 is for uh, social science, politics, and economics. There are um, four what we call Grand Ecole, which is uh, Escuelas de Ingenieros in Espanol. Uh, one for electronics, data processing, and uh, communication. One for chemistry, biology, physics. The other one for uh, agriculture. And the third one for uh, politics. Altogether, it is about 60,000 uh, students. Uh, this is, but I think we, I don't know if we have time to do this. This is the, the, the um, uh, study scheme in France with what we call L level, which is a license level, master level, and a doctorate level. Uh, this is, I think, just the same as in Spain. So uh, now I welcome to my talk, my research talk, which deals with foaming of polymer and blends by the assistance of block copolymers in order to provide microcellular foams in supercritical CO2. So this work was done together with uh, my laboratory of uh, chemistry in organic polymers uh, and um, a Spanish lab, Cellular Materials Laboratory in Valladolid, and as well a lab of mechanics in uh, the School of Engineering ENSAM. Uh, so, uh, this is the contents of my talk. I will first talk about rapidly about recent literature review, then what can block copolymers, how can block copolymers help our studies of polymeric foams, especially towards microfoaming. Third part is the mechanisms of foaming in the prisms of these block copolymers mainly based on the interplay between the solubility of the polymer in CO2, the nucleation growth foaming in CO2, and uh, the role of CO2 as a foaming agent, physical foaming agent. Uh, in this general work, the general objective was to fabricate micro and maybe nanocellular polymer foams from amorphous polymers, for example, PS is polystyrene, PMMA is polymethyl mesaclate in supercritical CO2, which is usually called a green solvent. On thick pieces, which is not usual, usually people do films, polymeric films, with uh, the assistance of s or with the addition of well-selected block copolymers. And in this um, general aim, the scientific question was can we generate a specific foaming mechanism and process in the presence of block copolymers, knowing that block copolymers generally can do nanostructured um, features either in homopolymers or in polymer blends. So the idea was to add variable contents of a copolymer as an additive or as a major component in a polymer blend, and to see how these structured materials can further generate micro or nano polymeric foams. So uh, the, the, the strategy is trying to use a synergetic effect of three cumulative phenomena. The first one is nanostructuration of organic block copolymers, I will call them BCP, which is Maybe you know it as self-assembly or ordered structures. The second one is the control of pseudophilicity, that is CO2 absorption within the ordered structure, which is a selective absorption of CO2, not everywhere in the material, but in selected parts. And uh, the third uh, phenomena is to use organic nucleating agents 
knowing that usually the nucleating agents are mineral molecules, and here they will be organic molecules. Uh, this idea was already, um, I would say, uh, proposed in uh, 2005 in macromolecules by Spontak, which said that nucleation, in order to have micro or nanopolymer foam, nucleation should be heterogeneous, should not be homogeneous, but should be heterogeneous. So you should have specific localization of nucleation and as well concentration of CO2 and in specific sites. But the problem is nearly all the time you have both heterogeneous and homogeneous nucleation and here the idea was to try to limit or even suppress homogeneous nucleation and keeping only heterogeneous nucleation. So this was the challenge. Uh, I will come rather quickly in the first part describing polymer and copolymer behavior, especially in CO2. So uh, block copolymers, either di-block or tri-block copolymers, are copolymers with blocks of one type together with a block of another type. This is a di-block, this is a tri-block, the red, uh, gray and green parts are the tri-blocks. Even you could have gradient block copolymers, but here in this talk we did not use them. As well, uh, these um, in former works, uh, what was said is, uh, which is a bit uh, similar, core shell particles, which is particle with a core, for example, the PMMA core and uh, a shell of a different polymer, for example, bucyl acrylate shell, could behave and structure the material in order to make microcellular foams. And the idea we had was to mimic these core shell particles by using other block copolymers that could induce other types of structuration different from core shell particles. Uh, in the literature, I will not comment on all this because I think I will, will not have time. A lot of block copolymer already have been used in CO2, especially fluoropolymers, polysiloxane, polyacrylates, and polyesters. They were either homopolymers, only one type of uh, monomeric units, or copolymers with two types or even three types of monomeric units, such as PMMA. PBA is polybucyl acrylate blocks, two outer blocks, and one center blocks. Uh, these copolymers were mainly used in film materials, very thin materials, uh, less than, I would say, 200 nanometers. And the idea was to try to use more general block copolymers in bulk parts, in thick parts of polymer materials. Uh, of course, with all these copolymers, their solubility in CO2 depends on the molar mass, the total molar mass, and as well on the composition, if they are di-block or tri-block copolymer, and on the block length. That is, by playing on both molar mass composition and block length, you can play on the copolymer solubility and at the same time on the copolymer structuration. Uh, these are examples I will not go uh, through very deeply about that type of fluoro side chain block copolymers. This is even perfluoro block copolymers. This is an homopolymer. This is uh, the, um, the uh, analogous block copolymers with polystyrene. This is works of the year 2008. And uh, these TEM micrograph here shows that those fluoro block copolymers can nanostructure at a nano level and furthermore, with the fluoro part, you see here the fluoro side part, it is well known that this fluoro part is a good, has a high CO2 uh, solubility and will play the role as CO2 concentrator. If you look further at phase diagrams, either versus pressure, 
of these block copolymers, you can, this is um, a proof, this is a study as well of 2011, that these block copolymers can generate different phase diagrams depending on pressure and can uh, generate different uh, either aggregates or unimers and that means you can structurize them and depending on pressure you could hope to do different finally polymer foams. Uh, this is the same type of structuration but this type with micelles. Uh, so another type of structuration going from hexagonal to lamella simply by playing on the CO2 penetration within the block copolymer, which is that type of, this is PDMS, so this is a siloxane block copolymer. This is not the type of copolymer we used, so now this is a summary. Uh, okay, these are now the particular block copolymers we chose. One is a tri-block between methyl mesacrylate and butyl acrylate. The butyl acrylate is the central block and two outer blocks. These are very uh, common commercial block copolymers, which are not expensive, which can be used at a large scale, even by plastergy processes, such as extrusion or injection. We use as well SBM, which is as well a tri-block copolymer between styrene butadiene and methyl mesacrylate, which is three different blocks, and a dye block between styrene and methyl mesacrylate. These three block copolymer were blended either in PMMA, which is an amorphous transparent polymer, or in polystyrene. You see them, they are different uh, physical characteristics, which are completely classical polymer, really generally used in industry. Uh, we chose them as neat homopolymers without uh, impact um, modifiers in order to have a basic model system that could have uh, very clear interpretations. Uh, if you look first at the neat block polymer MAM, Messier Mesacrylate, Pusillacrate, Messier Mesacrylate, you see that you get lamellar. So uh, these lamellar are interesting because you get them just by extrusion process. You don't need annealing, you don't need thermal treatments. You, the, uh, this block copolymer, sorry, spontaneously induce <coughs> a self-structuration. Oh. So, uh, we were sure about this because this was already described in literature. If you look at, uh, as well, the other one, di-block copolymer, it is as well inducing laminars, so this is classical and already known. Now, what happens if you put this di-block copolymer in PMMA, which was not yet uh, looked at, the blend is 50-50 by weight, and you see that you get warm-like or elongated micelles, but you see on these TEM photographs that the micelles are structured. You see, you, you have the direction of uh, injection, and as well, you see a shell here uh, on the edges of the structure, which is the PMMA blocks, and the center, the core, is butyl acrylate core. So this means that even in the presence of 50% of PMMA, this block copolymer can structure and can give uh, a self-structuration. This is at the lower concentration. This is concentration, for example, 95% weight PMMA and 5% uh, MAM. You can still get this rather good dispersion as micellar objects, but if you look at a closer scale, you see that this really micellar objects, and you see a core with a uh, butyl acrylate, this is uh, here the white part, and a ring, the outer part, which is the PMMA block, 
and the whole thing is the PMMA matrix. So this is the, um, the, the starting material we used. Uh, these are different concentration. This is a 90-10% blend. Still, the structuration as micelles with pucillacrate core. And you see here even a preferred direction of orientation, which is due to injection molding. Uh, you can, we saw afterwards that this direction of injection molding can be rubbed only by annealing at a certain temperature without killing the micelle presents. Uh, now, these materials, we wanted to put them in CO2. So what's happening, you see that if you look at CO2, um, it has a phase diagram, pressure as temperature, where at a certain point, above the critical point, you have a supercritical region where CO2 is in the supercritical state, uh, I would say mixing the liquid and gas phase. This critical point has rather uh, easy coordinates, 31 degrees Celsius and about 74 bars. So it is easy to reach and easy to work at. Uh, CO2 is well known to do chemical modification reaction, but here we want to use it as a foaming agent by putting our structured materials inside a CO2 vessel, a CO2 reactor. Saturation of the polymer in the CO2 reactor and playing by on the variable time or temperature or pressure by depressurization induce nucleation and growth of the, the cells of the voids in the forms and then control foaming by depressurization rate but also this was already known this is the general industry that controls the foam by uh, the, the rate of depressurization by here also by the presence of the block copolymer inside the PMMA or the polystyrene. Uh, this is the typical apparatus that was used to make uh, the, the work. This is the, the injection, uh, the, the single screw extruder or a minor extruder. This is, I would say, uh, plastergy equipment, classical. Uh, this is a CO2 vessel. It's a, it's a rather large vessel, well, large, 400 uh, cubic centimeter, where you can control pressure up to 450 bars at room temperature. And as well, there is a heating um, equipment allowing us to heat up to 250 degrees. With this equipment, we could control different saturation temperature in CO2 between room temperature and 80 degrees and different depressurization rates between 12 bar per minute up to 150 bar per minute. So playing on these parameters, we could uh, generate different foams. First, what we looked at is the CO2 absorption how much CO2 could uh, the polymer or the polymer blends absorb. Here you can see different polymers and blends, polystyrene, MAM, SBM, or polystyrene plus MAM. And you see that if you look at the higher curves here, just a small amount of MAM allows to absorb much, much more CO2 that than neat PMMA or neat polystyrene. So the first fact is the absorption of CO2 is not uh, linear to the, the initial blend, the initial copolymer input. You see as well another type of polymer, which is a homemade fluoro block copolymers. And here, as expected, with the fluoro block, you can even increase much more the CO2 concentration within the copolymer. And this is the concentration 
before foaming. This is the CO2 that will be used for foaming. So the idea is to put as much as possible CO2 in the polymer for its foaming. Uh, yes, this is, uh, the, of course, not only the affinity to CO2 plays a role, but as well the diffusion of CO2 in the polymer, that is the accessibility of CO2 in the polymer, as well the polymer viscoelastic behavior, deformation viscosities, and the rubber to glass transition, that is, that will play a role, especially for freezing in the foams during its expansion. You will see as well, if you have a rigid matrix, you will have a better chance to do microphone microfoam that if you have a soft matrix. Uh, these are the exact values of uh, solubility of carbon dioxide in, in our homopolymers and blends and it gives similar values as some values previously published by Marcosco and, and Spitaker in the United States. Uh, so now let us come to the foam itself. Uh, as you, okay, these are SEM pictures of the different foams. For example, this is pictures of the neat block copolymers, this is not a blend, at a depressurization rate of 60 bars per minute. And you see, but then by playing on the temperature, 70 or room temperature, or the copolymer type, dye block, tri block, SBM, tri-block MAM, you can have different foams. But if you look at all of these pictures, you see that the range of these foams is, I would say, uh, over the micro range. You see here the scale is really micrometers. This is not what we could call microfoams. This is foam, general foams, already known. Now, uh, let us go to polymer blends and look at polystyrene compared to a blend with SBM copolymer, 90, 10%. You see that if you compare neat polystyrene here on the left to blends with SBM on the right, you see the result is given here in this square. You decrease the average uh, cell size and you can you decrease as well the apparent density. We calculated the number of cells per cubic centimeter and this number of cells is increasing. This is the consequence. Uh, if you look at another polymer, PMMA, homopolymer compared to a blend of PMMA and the block copolymer MAM, 90-10% blend. You see the result is the same. If you look at neat PMMA compared to the blend, you decrease the cell size, you decrease the density, and you increase the number of cells per cubic centimeter. So uh, of, o always, this is the result, but always we played on the saturation temperature, that is the temperature at which CO2 was introduced and we played with the rate of depressurization of CO2. F for all these blends, the saturation pressure was kept the same. We did not play about this uh, pressure because we noticed that it was, uh, I would say, minor parameter. Uh, this is the general result as a table, but it's not so informative. It is the same. Uh, Example here of what can be said with the fluoro block copolymer. As I told you, the fluoro part is really a CO2 absorber. And here you see on the initial TE um, picture, this is not a TM, this is a, this is a SEM picture. You see that it's not nanostructured, it's only a dispersed. So this is not so interesting to make blends. And you see the result. 
it is a closed cell structure, but uh, it, is, it is not, we, we wish that these, uh, we did not work deep enough on this block copolymers to find the right length between polystyrene and uh, fluoro block to have the right balance in order that this copolymer can structurate really at a nanometer level in polystyrene, for example, because it has a polystyrene block. So this is just the beginning of our work. Uh, we did not really went deeper into this work because it is a polymer which is difficult to synthesize and it's not uh, so easily available. Now, uh, what is the process or the mechanism of foaming? It will be based on the interplay between CO2 solubility and nucleation and gross foaming. So, first of all, what happens in a one-step foaming process? That is, depressurized to induce the foam from a temperature, for example, of 40 degrees with variable depressurization rate. You see here the rates between 12 bar per minute up to 150 bar per minute. And you see that the quicker you depressurize and the lower the temperature drops. So this is a very interesting effect that was not yet noticed because at the same time as you induce the foam, you can cool your material and if you can cool it below the glass transition of the surrounding polymer, of the polymer matrix, then you can freeze in the growth of the cell and you can prevent the growth in order to have microcells or even maybe nanocells, which is not easy in uh, bulk materials. Nanocells were already noticed in polymer films, but not in bulk polymer pieces. So uh, this is the first step, and you can notice it both with a fixed, from a fixed saturation temperature or from a fixed depressurization, depressurization rate, but playing from the temperature at which you will drop the pressure. Uh, OK, so. Uh, what could happen, for example, if you say, as I showed you first in my first transparency, if you have a block copolymer structured as a micelles. Suppose here, and in fact, I believe this is what we have, you have outer, an outer crown of PMMA of polystyrene, such as in uh, MAM copolymer or SBM copolymer, the whole thing in a PMMA matrix, but the inner part of the micelle being, as in our case, a block of polybucyl acrylate. Maybe I haven't noticed, no, I don't remember, but I tell you now, this polybucyl acrylate block has a very low Tg. It's about minus 50 degrees, so it is a rubbery phase in the core made of PBA. And this PBA is responsible of the swelling in CO2. Of course, as its Tg is very low, it will never vitrify. It will always stay in the rubbery phase. So it will enable the growth. But you see, the growth only in the core of the micelles. Whereas, for the outer skins, the crown, it will be a glassifying shell, either with polystyrene or PMMA. This is, as I told you, the temperature effect here. If you drop the temperature, for example, at 20 or 0 degrees, oh, sorry, uh, this polystyrene or PMMA crown will glassify and will stop the growth of the points in the foam. So furthermore, 
I precised here that I believe it will restrict diffusion and it will uh, help CO2 to stay within the core of the CO2-philic core before foaming in order to retain the maximum CO2 at specific sites, specific location of the material inside the micelles. So uh, this is the example of a micellar object, moiety, but you can believe that this um, mechanism of uh, localization in rubbery inner areas can be performed for example in elongated micelles. You remember first I showed you elongated micelles and it works. We did them before. It could work in as well uh, what I call strawberry uh, objects. This is as well possible with block copolymers. This is the case of micelles. You can imagine any type of uh, structured object, as soon as these objects contain a dispersed nanostructure stabilized in a matrix, you can obtain micro or even nanofoams. The condition is that you put more CO2 in the block copolymer than in the matrix, I said it by the weight percentage of CO2 in the copolymer is superior to the percentage of CO2 in the matrix. This is possible with these types of example I showed you. Uh, the, the other condition is you have a rubbery inner area and as well you should manage to limit the extent of growth due to vitrification either of the hard blocks, the surrounding blocks here in green, or of the matrix in light green here. If you, have, if you play on this mechanism, you can get nanofoams. Uh, another example you could thought have, this is an example of structured foams, uh, a bit as a layered foams. Here you see uh, a layered foam between dense layer and foamed layer. This is a type of structure that was obtained with a different percentage of block copolymer. This is a type of foam that you get if you go to high percentages of block copolymer, always in a PMMA matrix. This is the example of 25-75 weight percent. Uh, okay, so uh, I think I will come to the conclusion by saying the uh, advantages of block copolymers in CO2. They show a general a panel of various nanostructure preserved or enhanced in CO2. This is, uh, it is not, they are not destroyed in CO2. The blocks may show selective absorption and localize CO2 in domains depending on the nanostructure type and the block type the blocks may reduce diffusion of CO2 during foaming. Well-chosen block copolymers can be considered as polymer additive. This is more for the application or for the industrial possible developments for any thermoplastic polymer to improve its foaming behavior towards microcellular foams. As well, one could think of increasing the cell density by saying that each, if, if, you, if you get to really heterogeneous nucleation, you can say that each micelle could be a nucleus. This is difficult because normally you kill nucleus and not all the nucleus act as a cell generator. But the ideally, you could think of this. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, so far, we managed to reduce the average cell size down to 0 0.2 micrometers, that's 200 nanometers, and cell densities of about 10 to the power 14 cells per cubic centimeter. And uh, generally speaking, I would say that the use of 
nanostructuring CO2 philic copolymers is really a versatile route to produce micro or ultra micro or even nanocellular polymer foams from commodity polymers, that is general uh, polymers, polystyrene, maybe polyethylene, polypropylene, with an easy mixing process, for example, extrusion uh, and injection molding, followed by a batch foaming in a one or two step process. Two step, I did not talk about it, but it is uh, another process where you saturate your polymer in the CO2 reactor, you take it out of the reactor and you foam it in an oven, in a different oven. That is, you make the blends in two steps, uh, the foam, sorry, the foam blend in two steps. So uh, in this way, really thick homogeneous samples can be produced from any type uh, of polymer. Uh, so the perspectives are, first of all, this is one I should mention, is to go to really nanocells. Nanocells in polymers means below uh, 100 nanometers, 80 nanometers, and this is really hard in bulk pieces. That is not so far achieved with low density. This is achieved as polymer films, but never in bulk pieces with low densities. Uh, you could think about uh, trying to control the homogeneity of the foam, because so far we noticed that in all the pieces we got, we have skin effects, and we have to get rid of the skin. Sometimes the skin is helpful, some other times it is not helpful for the, 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 the applications. Uh, we're trying to model the CO2 solubility and diffusion in these heterogeneous blends. The modelization works in homogeneous materials, but not in heterogeneous materials. And uh, the fourth aspect would be to make new thermoplastic polymer foams with ordered forms, as I showed you uh, foams like this, with a certain order, or uh, gradient foams, being with different densities all along the material. Uh, now I will come to the final transparency of my talk. And I would like to thank you for your attention, uh, to acknowledge the project that could allow this work, which is called Listrapt, Lightning of Structures and Composites, which is funded by a uh, national research agency in France. The different laboratory partners, uh, CRPP, LCPO, ICMCB, in, and ENSAM, to uh, thank Arkema Group for providing the block copolymers, to thank the University of Valladolid, the Cermat Laboratory, uh, with whom we have a PhD collaboration to go on with this work, and to thank the uh, TM Microscopy Center, Border Imaging Center, for making uh, the structural studies of uh, the polymer blends. So thank you. So, uh, so far, uh, we have, we have, we have uh, tried to characterize from the thermal point of view, mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, we noticed that, uh, and this, this was theoretically predicted uh, by Knudsen, the Knudsen effect, meaning that if you go with cell size, all of them below a certain size, the thermal conductivity drops drastically. Mm -hmm. You have a step in the thermal conductivity, and this was predicted uh, in polymers, but not shown experimentally. And this, we tried to show it experimentally. That's to make uh, super insulators, mm -hmm. thermal insulators. Uh, another application, but we don't know if it's possible, is to have transparent insulators. For example, mm -hmm. if you have a glass mm -hmm. 
which is at the same time a thermal insulator due to uh, to the the the, the, the pores. Yes. Uh, another thing is uh, that is um, more or less known is to have a look at mechanical properties, mm -hmm. compression mechanical properties for impact uh, protection uh, in the micro or nano pore region, which is not known, but which is supposed to bring higher impact strength than classical foams. Mm -hmm. So the, the three lines is transparency, thermal properties, and mechanical applications. Very, very interesting. Is it possible also to use uh, these materials as acoustic uh, insulators? So we don't know, but uh, I believe it, could, it, it should be measured. It mm -hmm. should be measured, and from the theoretical point of view, I don't know. I, I haven't checked. Mm -hmm. But it could well, be, because it, it, it is known. It could it be. It could well be. Yeah. When, when you have a foam, usually it, yeah. it could yeah. be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because if you want uh, to use yeah. it, uh, then uh, like, mm. like a glass, and you mm. can obtain both at the same time, yeah. Uh, yeah. thermal and, uh, yeah. and acoustic. Very yeah. interesting. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, do you have a question? No, es es uh, excuse me one moment, please. Uh, the use of these phones for uh, in, uh, insulator in integrated circuits for the for the interconnects. Ah, good question. Uh, I think uh, people tried it because in this case you need films, and uh, people, for example, uh, from IBM in the United States, people like Hedrick, tried it in I think a long time ago. 15 years ago, and it works. It is used for, do, do you mean a low dielectric constant materials? It works, but it works with a very high TG polymers, such as polyimides, as films. But the, the way to do them is not CO2. It is um, phase separation or um, as well block copolymers with degradation of one of the blocks. So this was done as f in films. But this we tried to work with bulk pieces, that pieces, for example, of three, four centimeters. So it's not so easy to synthesize materials on these phones? Sorry? It's not so easy to synthesize materials on these phones? Uh, I would, yes, I would say so. Because this technique in CO2 is more adapted for bulk pieces than thin films. Uh, yes. But then all of this by, by CVD or some chemical process to ah. this kind of uh, I would say not. I would say not. No, really. I would say not. Uh, I haven't checked, but I would say not. Um, I think it. Things were done um, with films of structured PMMA, with uh, selective etching in PMMA. Um, it was for electronic applications, as far as I remember, uh, but not, it was not by CO2. I think CO2 is not the right technique for generating uh, films of foams with a very controlled uh, thickness and uh, surface homogeneity. Any more questions? No, for a moment. Thank you very much again. <laughs>